Hello and welcome to Spectres Above Spectres. Today in this episode I'm talking to Mikkel Krause Fransen. We're having a great conversation about his book Going Nowhere Slow, The Aesthetics and Politics of Depression. Before we jump into it however, I just want to ask you to check out my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Simon Obirik. If you donate whatever you can, whatever you're able to, we can create a lot of cool philosophical content together. But for now, here's the conversation with Mikkel Krause Fransen. Today I am going to interview Mikkel Krause Fransen. And if you don't know who Mikkel Krause Fransen is, he is the author of a book called Going Nowhere Slow. The Aesthetics and Politics of Depression. And Mikkel, thank you so much for joining me today in this discussion. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, the thing about your book that uh, that, that really <laughs> was really interesting to me was uh, in the beginning of the book, you, you, you tr- you're you trying to, to taunt the reader a bit. Uh, you're trying to be cheeky with us a bit. And I really like that because it's, it's so uh, on the nail. In a subtitle to one of the chapters, I'll just find it here, to the subtitle called uh, Scenographic Symptomatology, you, you you make a parenthesis, which I really like, in which you're writing, Scenographic Symptomatology, or you're probably so depressed and exhausted by now that you can't be bothered to read this. <laughs> mm. And uh, I was, you know, uh, it, it's cheeky, but it's so on the nose for me. It's so precise and so exact, because I was at that point, <laughs> I was actually getting tired, getting exhausted from reading, not from the content of the book, but from just the act of reading itself. Um, so, so I was immediately turned on to this topic from that point on. Um, so, so, so just to just to get down to brass tacks, you're writing about depression, and when I talk about this topic with my friends, with my family, with my uh, study bodies, etc they have a hard time translating uh, depression from what's going on inside of your head to something going on outside, you know, in society. Mm. And that's what this book uh, deals with. So I was wondering, what is depression to you in this book? And if you if you can get around to it, what, um, how does it differ from the usual way we think of depression? Right. Um, well, I mean, to stick to your image, um, I would say that depression is both within and no, um, depression is both uh, inside and outside the in individual. Um, so to me, depression is a psychopathology that is as political as it is personal. Um, of course, depression is an illness um, and a painful one at that that is experienced at an in, at an at an individual level but it cannot be reduced to that level um it is not merely a matter of chemistry it is not merely a matter of biology or your genes it is not merely a matter of your individual willpower or the life choices that you make um etc uh i think that what is at stake here is also material issues it is monetary issues it can be societal political economic issues and that is my prime example. I mean, there are plenty of evidence suggesting or documenting, in fact, that <clears throat> if you are indebted or in a state of debt, um, you're much more likely to become depressed than people who are not in debt. So I would say, of course, depression is um, a painful um, individual experience um, but it has also to do with the society we live in, the jobs that we may or may not have. Um, so there are all these different causes and reasons um, why you are depressed. Um, and these reasons and causes are, are mostly left out of the diagnostic manuals and also of mainstream psychological discourses. And I think we've become so used to, you know, thinking depression and other mental illnesses in terms of the personal or the person experiencing it that um, what you described at the beginning you know the idea that 
clever people <laughs> who are depressed um and even though they at some level they know that their depression has something to do with their situation in the world or their situation in life and with they are having just finished their education and they are indebted and they cannot find a job even though they know um cognitively uh, one might say that their depression is tied up with these societal issues it is still so hard for them not to remain caught within the therapeutic um individual psychological discourse um okay well that all makes sense to me that you cannot really uh, detach the individual from the circumstances in which he or she is inscribed into i guess you could say mm. and um um one one curious thing you do in this book which i really like is that you sort of um pose two questions that sort of demonstrate the societal depression that we are in you know how are you and what time is it um why do you consider these two to be significant well um i find them significant at an um uh, phenomenological level uh one might say uh in the sense that having read a lot about depression and having talked to people who are depressed and having read a lot of uh, literary and fictional books uh, etc it's clear to me that one question that keeps popping up and a question that remain very difficult to answer <laughs> to people who are depressed is the question of how are you doing or how are you and you can either choose to lie and say well thanks i'm fine how are you or you can actually answer the question um honestly saying well i feel like shit um <laughs> i couldn't get out of bed this morning i just lost my job um my partner is an idiot whatever yeah. um um and the other question about time or temporality i think that's pertinent because i consider depression to be an illness in and of time so i think there's a deep connection between depression and temporality so my claim is that if you ask a depressed person what time is it or what time it is um you can also get a sense of um the state of society or the state of the world in i mean i'm not the only one who in that sense consider the depressed person to be some kind of seismograph um of the contemporary society um and i think that that um that loss of futurity that is at stake in my mind um in depression and um the inability to imagine the future uh, when you are depressed i think that is symptomatic of the world that we're living in um the feeling that there is no tomorrow the feeling in depression that the seconds are just you know dragging themselves along and when you look at the clock and then you look at the clock again it is as if the time hasn't moved at all um so that kind of temporal experience i find um both helpful and pertinent in thinking about these um difficult um Im- important issues yeah yeah i can t- i can totally see that because there has got to be something symptomatic about the way we're constantly checking in with each other um mm. <laughs> you know hey are you okay is this okay are you doing good whatever <laughs> um it, it seems to me like a very pathological feature about our society uh, that we treat each other in this way but um you you made an interesting point one uh, my my friend and i was actually talking about this uh, prior to this interview and he you know i was asking him well how are you you know how are you uh, doing and he was mm. like i'm fine but not really and then we were sort mm. of talking about it and he was like well when you say something else then uh then you know i'm good when you're actually saying well life is actually pretty shit right now you know it seems almost like a childish provocation was his point mm. and it seems like you're actually <laughs> acting against the common thing to say here it seems almost yeah. childish We're like <laughs> yeah and really but also like... i mean i've often found myself um embarrassing people and myself really um when answering that question um honestly right i mean saying what you really feel i mean that can actually be a quite embarrassing thing to do and yes. i guess 
I mean, the thing is um, that there's also this hidden expectation um, inside that question, that seemingly innocent question. There is this expectation that you are supposed to be feeling great, that you're supposed to be happy, yeah. that you're supposed to be, you know, just having the time of your life when most of us, most of the time, are really not. Yeah, uh, yeah, I completely agree. Um, the, the other thing, though, that's that's something I, I find, you know, what time is it? And the, the, the uh, temporality of depression, that seems to be a tricky one for people to, to understand as well. Because you have a quote in here somewhere at the beginning of the book in which you deem depression a, a, a sort of a chronopathology. Mm. I really like that. <laughs> I really like that concept. Uh, but I was wondering if you could sort of expand on the temporality of depression, um, because that seems to be a struggling point for a lot of people, and myself included, I guess. Hmm. Well, I mean, the first thing to note, I guess, is that there's been a proud tendency within psychology, and I think going back to Sigmund Freud, at least um, a proud tradition and influential tradition of thinking about temporality in depression and in melancholy as something that is mostly related to the past. I mean, you have lost something or someone and then you grieve or you mo you mourn it, that loss. And if you are kind of stuck in that loss, it becomes pathological. And then you are in the transition from grieving to becoming depressed. Um, that's kind of the uh, Freudian framework. And was, what I was finding in the very beginning of my research period or project um, was that it struck me that depression, maybe it had more to do with the future than the past um, and the loss of the future, as I also mentioned before, or the loss of the ability to imagine the future, because of course that loss is as subjective as it is objective and it is as imaginary as it is real right i mean of course the future is not objectively lost but that's what you feel like and of course there are also um i would say objective historical reasons for you to think that the future has actually already been lost um and then i read a lot of of um phenomenological studies um from within a German tradition where they have, um, I mean, and that goes back to Karl Jaspers, who is perhaps mostly known for his philosophical work, but who was also doing a lot of important work within the field of psychopathology. Um, and he wrote this huge book called um, General Psychopathology. Um, and he, he talks a lot about mental illness and time. Um, and then, I mean, Building on his work, we have a more contemporary scholar called Thomas Fuchs, who works at the intersection between philosophy and psychiatry, really. Um, also um, doing a lot of research on that uh, aspect of depression. And he, he talks about desynchronization is his key concept. And I, and, and I found that incredibly useful, um, thinking about the desynchronization that occurs, the temporal desynchronization that occurs in depression um, and what he means by that or what I mean by that is that you kind of feel out of sync with the surrounding world when you are depressed and the time that you inhabit so to speak is not the same as the chronological clockwork time um, 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 outside you um, so I think that has been important for me to think about more, um, that temporal slowness or inertness that you feel when you are depressed. And, and I mean, that, I mean, that it goes without saying um, at this point, really, that I've also been, I have found it crucial to really take seriously the experiencing or, or the experiences um, of depression, um, both within academic work, but also within 
literary fiction, artworks, films, etc. And I mean, sometimes I think that aspect to be lacking in certain critical leftist analysis uh, of depression. Um, and I, I guess we can come back to that later on. But I, but I think that's also been really important to me. Right. And I actually see a lot of what you're well, I well, when I was reading the book first, I, I, I noticed a lot of, I guess, intellectual debt to Mark Fisher. Who's sort mm. of, uh, and others as well, Berardi, and you, you just mentioned <laughs> two influences yourself. But I, I'm a guy who primarily comes from Fisher. This entire podcast was sort of uh, created um, from his writings mm. in a lot of ways. So that's the one I was sort of noticing. And I guess that's what really separates you from him. Because, you know, if, if I'm not... Uh, being too simplistic here, I guess that he he talks about as well the the cancellation of the future, the slow mm. cancellation of the future, and the um, you know how how the virtualities have been blocked off in a way that of course mm. time still moves and history is still being written, but there's nothing significantly new about it, um, you know in in a in a really exciting newish way, um, and you know I sort of see you know writing about this. And um, I kind of have a, a, sometimes I have a kind of a, a hard time accepting uh, that, what you call it, assumption in a way. I guess this is me being a bit critical. Uh, so, um, uh, because when it comes to, to, to these futures, um, uh, it seems to me that some people out there, they don't view the world in this depressive manner. Um, when when they look toward the future, uh, you know, if we talk about these objectivities out there, you know, c climate crisis, uh, impending economic crisis, um, mm. more coronaviruses out there. I, I I I guess I would argue that most people don't actually l look to the future as something menacing in a way. You know, when I'm talking with friends <laughs> on my age, you know, in in our twenties. We, we, we usually joke about it, but there's this hope, and I guess this is something we could return to as well, because you, you wrote about this in the book as well. They turn to this non-radical hope of, well, there's got to be something beyond, you know, yeah, climate crisis will come, but we'll survive. We'll figure out something. Uh, does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said. Um, yeah, yeah um, and I think... I mean, it was, I mean, I can't believe I haven't already mentioned the work and the name of Mark Fisher because, uh, uh, I mean, I owe him so much in terms of intellectual debt uh, that can never be repaid. Um, so, um, yeah, now that's um, set and over with, uh, I guess, um, just um, paying that homage. But I think, I mean, I get what you're saying, but what I've been trying to historicize or periodize in a way has been a historical trajectory from the early 1970s onwards, um, which I would consider to be our, our historical present in a way. And I mean, if you talk about the belief in a better world or the belief that we will have a bright and shiny future. And I mean, and that certainly characterized some movements of especially the early 20th century, right? I mean, you had the avant-garde, you had yeah. all kinds of movements um, that really believed that they were able to instantiate or initiate uh, a, a better version of the world, either right now or sometime in the future. And what what is clear to me is that from the beginning of the 1970s after 68 perhaps and with the crisis of the 70s that are so reminiscent of today what you find there is that that belief sort of evaporates and i mean jimmy carter held this famous crisis of confidence speech in 1979 where he talked about that the young american generation for the first time in american history they didn't believe that their future would be better than their present and that they would be the first generation in history that were actually not better off than the previous one. And I think there's just been really some data a year or two ago that actually documented um, within a US context that 
uh, that that is actually now the truth. That if you are born now or young today, you are probably worse off than your parents were. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. And I think, I mean, that are, these are objective historical economic facts to a certain extent. But then there's, of course, also the spirit or the, you know, the general atmosphere surrounding and accompanying those facts that are. And this atmosphere um, is as important to analyze and understand uh, as the facts themselves. Um, and I, of course, it's not the case that everyone is feeling like the future, that there will be no tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, and of course, we are not all depressed. We are not equally depressed. Mm. Um, but what I think Fisher is trying to say uh, or wanting to say, and what I am also in his vein, so to speak, trying to say is that when you are depressed, then you have this feeling. And that is, you know, not ungrounded in fact. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. It makes sense. Um, I guess one thing I'll sort of challenge you on and then we'll move on because this is really an interesting thing. I, I you know, this um you know, this explanation of the broken promise. You know, we were promised mm. something and then that fell through and now we create hauntological music and are depressed mm. or you know, it's it's just something about it. Um I'm trying to square it with like a Deleuze Aquatarian desire in a way. Mm. Um because you know you know they they were notable uh, notably um, post ideological so they you know desire expands so whenever something is sort of being imposed on us in a way you know we we're actually we're actually talking about not a lack but actually an expansion of desire mm. so when i see the when i see the world um you know i i i think we have to revert back to the question they asked at the beginning of Antiedipus, why do people desire their own suppression as if it was their liberation or salvation in some way? Mm. And, you know, I was just wondering if you could put some words on that for the Toulouse Aquatarians out there. Well, it's it's funny because I, I used to be quite Deleuzean. That was my first real, you know, fandom, I guess. It was a course I had in Germany uh, with one of his um, English translators or... Australian actually, Paul Patton, he was oh. called. And I was really into Deleuze at that point. Um, yeah. And then I've sort of, you know, not left because that's a stupid thing to do and who cares anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think that Franco B. Baradi, who I also have my disagreements, disagreements with, um, certainly much more than I do with Fisher, um, because I think Fisher is much more attuned to the real suffering of people who are depressed in a way that Bifo never has been and never will be. But at one in one of his books, and I don't remember which one, um, he writes about how depression is sort of, you know, a black hole in the edifice, the philosophical edifice of Deleuze and Guasari. Yeah. And they have been able to conceptualize so many different pathologies and, of course, most famously, schizophrenia. Yeah. But they have never really addressed the topic of depression. And maybe that's because he writes that it falls outside um, the whole way of thinking, that they cannot actually, um, within, uh, with their conceptual apparatus, they cannot account for depression um, in a way. But what he then does, and that's actually quite, quite um, um, original, I, I would say, is that then he goes on to discuss, I think it's the end of What is Philosophy, um, yeah. the last book. And he says that when they're talking about, I think there's a passage there about black holes or something like that. And they are discussing something completely different. And I think they're talking about old age and, you know, yeah, yeah. and Bifo then goes on to say, this is where they are actually describing depression. And I think he's totally right in a way, and there's a lot to look into. Um, I had a passage about that this in my dissertation, and I cannot remember if it found its way through to the uh, book version. Um, but I mean, that's an interesting discussion. Um, but yeah, the question of desire and depression is, of course, what is at stake here, right? And I mean, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, because well, Mark Fisher has this uh, quote. Uh, I'll never forget it. I unfortunately forgot where, uh, in which blog post he was. He was writing, but he said that Deleuze and Guattari was right in everything, on until those points where they disagreed with Lacan. Um, mm. so, so you know, this just uh, I was just sort of uh, making sense of the. I don't know. Yeah, the the methodological conflicts. I don't know if that's mm. really the word, you know, the concept to use here. But because you know, there seems, and you you do it sort of as well. You know, you're drawing in this book on Deleuze and Guattari, and you're drawing on Baradi and Lacan. And I, yeah, I was just trying to sort of square um, the explanations um, and how they how they sort of function. Sure. Um, Okay, well, we'll move on. We'll not really move on. We'll actually move on to something uh, um, that is very chic right now, I would argue. <laughs> uh, and that is depressive realism and mm. the way you view it in the book. I thought it, I thought it was really a tremendous passage you had of it. So I guess what I'm asking is, can you explain depressive realism and sort of, uh, you know, how you view it in this day and age? Hmm. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the notion of or the idea of depressive real realism stems from an infamous article by this point uh, from 1979 uh, by two scholars called Alloy and Abramson, um, who 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 you know launched the launched the notion of depressive realism to say that. Depressed people are not depressed because they have a distorted or delusional view of reality. They are depressed because they actually have a more accurate assessment or perception of reality than people who are not depressed. And of course, that caused quite a bit of controversy. Um, but I think it goes back, and I also write about this in the book, it goes back to the article by Freud that um, hasn't been brought up now, um, his um, 1917 article, I think it is, uh, on mourning and melancholia, where he at some point speculates why it is the case that depressed people seem to have a keener eye from, for the truth than others who are not melancholic. Um, and I think that whole notion has then had some traction within a, a certain speculative but also pessimist kind of philosophy. Right. Um, and I think, I mean, I've been skeptical uh, of that idea from the very beginning, not really on scientific grounds. I'm, and that particular study that I refer to has been, you know, debunked in various ways. But I think it's much more on political grounds that I disagree with this notion, but also on the, I mean, in terms of trying to understand what goes on in depression, I think the notion of depressive realism tends to romanticize depression in a way that I'm not comfortable with. And of course, that not only goes back to Freud, that also goes back to Aristotle, mm -hmm. who, who established this quite strong connection between the genius, the male genius or the creative mind, and then, you know, the mad and melancholic um, mm -hmm disposition in a way and I think I mean what Mark Fisher is really good at is showing how depressive realism or the realism that you uh, subscribe to when you are depressed depressed that that kind of realism that depressive realism actually goes hand in hand with what he calls capitalist realism so that the re realism that you are promoting so to speak is actually totally in sync with the realism that capitalism uh, promotes or wants you to promote. Um, and I mean, there, I mean, I think that's true actually. And I mean, I was reading uh, Anne's block at one point and we can maybe get back to his notion of hope, but he writes at the beginning of his trilogy that um, uh, he writes um, about capitalist nihilism or cynicism and he says that capitalism actually seeks to spread cynicism and nihilism so that people people are actually convinced that there is nothing to be done um and of course i mean that said of course um contemporary ideologies of happiness and positivity and optimism they are all stupid they all need to be criticized i mean that goes without saying but i think that's not really an 
um, enough, and it also doesn't really necessitate the notion of depressive realism. Absolutely. Um, um, I was also uh, referring to to some of the crit. I remember specifically two critiques. One that if you know, it's it's a very arrogant point of view in a in a mm. way. You know, you know, I have no illusions. You know, that's also a, a thing Fisher writes in in his um, little essay on Joy Division, I believe, where you know it's completely black and white, and you know I am completely without illusions. That's that's you know I, I find that to be so true, and we can get back to that in, in in a second. And the other thing which I think is very spot on as well, the critique you make is that these people, um, well, not all of them, but you know a certain highlighted cases of depressive realists um you know people who are very out there very um forward uh, speaking in a way sort of you know they 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 spout inane platitudes you know they're being banal mm. when they say something about life you know it's it's a very uh, it's not a very productive way i guess and again I'm, I'm, i was trying to make the distinction that of course there are some people who are depressive realists that you know are you know, introverted and 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 introverted and careful how they choose their words. But there are some people out there who, you know, especially YouTubers, <laughs> who who mm. sort of uh, puts everything on the line and sort of package this depressive realism as an ideology. You know, we have so many. You you just touch upon it it's yourself. We have so many ideology. Yeah, ideologies. I guess I'll call them of philosophies. We have pessimism. Uh, there's nihilism. There's um, anti-natalism, which has been mm. huge <laughs> in these times. And, you know, Benjamin Noyes, I remember he was sort of uh, critiquing, or I don't know, critiquing or commenting on continental philosophy being dark. Mm. You know, Thomas Ligotti, uh, Ray Brassier's nihilist, <laughs> and Eugene mm. Thacker, you know. There's a lot of darkness going on, I mm. suppose you could say. Yeah. Um and and I see it as well. Do you, do you you know? Uh, we talked about it just prior to this uh, to the recording. You know the Wojak Duma mean, hmm. um, who was very popular, and um, you, you know. And and do all your listeners know what that is? You reckon, or should you just explain that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll make the quick explanation. But I okay. find that he's very he's actually very popular because he's he's okay. part of the, <laughs> he's part of the Wojak. Uh, character who has a sure. distinct outlook, who is very yeah. I guess people could Google him, but he's always bald. But usually, always portrayed as being bald and then being white skinned, etc. And you know, and then there's the 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 um, there's the version called Duma, but there's actually a lot of Umas. You know, <laughs> this is mm. very m mimetics. I guess we're we're going into right now. There's the Duma, the Bluma. The Kuma, the Suma, you know, all of them sort of expressing um, a, a person, you know, the 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 apotheosis of a person, or sort of the representation of a person, uh, you know, to the to the most extreme degree. So the Suma is a uh, is of course the people who are younger than you and I, you know, coming uh, coming after millennials, etc. But the Duma, let's just stick with the Duma. I was getting out, I was getting uh, on a tangent there. No, it's great. <laughs> the Duma, you know, there's a there's really an entire law to this thing. You can't really just mention one meme. There's an <laughs> entire network thing that you kind of have to deal with. But the the Duma guy, you know, he's wearing a black beanie. He has a black coat or a black uh, hoodie of some kind, and he's usually always smoking. And he's looking tired and disheveled. You know, he has bags under his eyes. He has a patchy beard. He's not kept at all. And he sort of expresses this mindset, I guess, of depressive realism. And I was wondering if you could uh, put some words. You know, well, that's a very Danish way of saying things. But could you, uh, could you, could you talk a bit about the Wojak Duma meme um, mm. if you've encountered him? I have actually. I think that's one of the only memes that I've encountered in my thirty-six-year-old life. Uh, really, um, I've not been. Yeah, I guess I'm maybe already too old um, for that. But I mean, I have come across it um, actually, and I think the key issue here is one of masculinity and i think that also resides in the question of depressive realism or pessimism uh, uh, i 
just finished this uh, review essay of Eugene Thacker's uh, Infinite Resignation, where I actually deal with, but also critically go through almost all of the things that you were mentioning before, um, and that particular dark philosophy, yeah. as one of the books is called. And what I found to be true, or what I claim in this essay, is that that kind of pessimism, and of course there are different kinds of pessimism, mm -hmm. Uh, in plural, but that kind of pessimism, it, it so often it harbors a position of privilege, in a way, or it is a very privileged position to take um, that way of thinking. And and I think the Vojek Duma is also a very masculine character. Um, um, and I think, I mean, we have, talking about depression also, I mean, we have a ratio that is, I guess, still around two to one in the favor of females compared to males. So there are twice as many women who are diagnosed with depression than men. Yeah. And of course, there are a lot of reasons for this um, sort of, you know, men don't go to the doctor and all this stupid shit. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then when you look at the rates of suicides, it's almost completely reversed. And I think we have so many cases uh, also just from recent years of suicides, Jerome Rogers, Daniel Desner, all kinds of, you know, they've been reported on in the news where people who are just, you know, having a, a unpaid, uh, what's that called, uh, um, a parking billet, uh, it's called in Danish, Park, um, parking ticket, parking park, ticket park, of yeah, course, yeah, or yeah. a traffic fine on $20 or 10 quid or whatever, yeah. and then you cannot pay it and there's some time passes and then you're just so desperate at it at, and, and indebted that you end up killing yourself. Um, so I think the question of suicide is also really interesting. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, what I also found when I was looking into the Duma character was that Ryan Gosling's character from Blade Runner 2049 yeah. is often mentioned as well as this, you know. Ooh, yeah. I could, yeah, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. yeah. And but what I always come back to is Fight Club, mm -hmm. um, and Tyler Durden's famous speech in Fight Club. I don't know if you remember that or the listeners, but where he talks about that Tyler and all of his Fight Club gang members, they are the middle children of history. He says yeah. they have no purpose or place. And I'm just quoting now. I have it right here. Okay. They so I'll just read it out. Yeah. yeah. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is the spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We have all been raised on television to believe that one day we would all be millionaires and movie guards and rock stars, but we won't. We are slowly learning that fact and we are very, very pissed off. Boom. <laughs> and of course, I mean, that is also really interesting in terms of 4chan and 8chan and, you know, yeah. Uh, toxic, fragile masculinity. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, and of course the question is also, when does depression lead to implosion and when does it lead to explosion, so to speak? Um, when I wrote a Danish version, uh, a book version of my PhD, I, ha I, I had a chapter on this question and the question of suicides, but also the cases, the extremely interesting cases of depressed people who are mentally ill people who are turning their depression outwards, so to speak. So they kill themselves, but they take a lot of peel, people down with them, tragically enough, whether that is um, school shooters, uh, the Virginia Tech school shooter, yeah. or whether it's the German pilot, uh, Andreas Lubitz, I think it was in 2014, where he crashed with his yeah. airplane. Um, so we have these murderous suicides. We have a lot of young men who feel that they have been robbed of their future and are thus entitled to act out, mm -hmm. but who are still fucking depressed yeah. <laughs> and who have a history with mental illness. Um, and then, of course, we also have, and I'm just, you know, going on here, but I think we also have a the idea, the ideological idea of manning up mm -hmm. as a solution or a cure to depression. Yeah. Um, which of course brings uh, Jordan Peterson uh, into the equation in a way. Um, right. And I think one of the contrasts to the Duma is the go-getter. I guess you're familiar with him. But, oh, but, actually, no. <laughs> okay, you should definitely look into that. But 
I mean, he is pretty much the same picture, but someone has just replaced a lot of the key words and sentences ah, that okay. surround the Duma. Yeah. And the go-getters <laughs> sentences, they go like something like, what is done is done, there's only four words. And it goes like something like, in control of his own destiny. Yeah. And enough is enough. And he has a plan. So he's really manning up. Yeah, he's, yeah. And not just... You know, smoking cigarettes in his, you know, baggy jeans and black clothes and etc. So yeah, there's a lot of issues here that are, yeah, incredibly exciting to talk about. Absolutely, you're actually well. One thing is, there's actually a Dumaret. I don't know if you know. Oh. her. yeah, that's actually a yeah, okay. version of the Duma. Now. I thought that was impossible in a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, okay, no, no. it isn't. <laughs> it isn't, and she's actually kind of cute. I don't know if I should say that. I probably shouldn't say that, but you know, if if you ever look her up, you know, she looks you know attractive, and you actually see those two together, and you're kind of like, ah, oh, you know, even a meme can find love, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, the the other thing, you know, because you're really touching upon something very topical right now, and that's uh, the whole men's rights, uh, mm. the manosphere, I guess they call it as well. Yeah. Within that, uh, you know, they have the pill speak. Do you know the pill speak? No. Uh, they they sort of take the example from Matrix. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know the red pill. You know. Yeah. If, you, if you're. <laughs> You know, I have to be careful because some of the people listening are actually accelerationists from the right, so I kind of have to be careful. But okay, you know, you know, they basically um, impose this misogynistic way of looking at the world. You know, mm. females or you know, fem fem feminoids, I believe they call them. You know, the stasis okay. out there, and that's my point. There are some people who have, uh, you know, the incels. Mm. Yeah, uh, exactly. They have they have taken the the black pill. There's something called you can be black pilled now, okay. And that's uh, that's actually very in tune with what we're talking about right now because if you're black pilled, you have sort of accepted the truth, the biological deterministic truth, that you were born not to have sex. You know, within the mm. incel community, and you know, it's a very fatalistic way of viewing things. It's a very defeatist way of looking at things. And they, you know, there's a lot of body dysmorphia going on. Obviously, mm. one of the most, uh, one of one that really made an impression on me was the incel who made a post. He posted a picture of his uh, wrists, and then he said, "My wrists are too slender, too slim, to you know, for a woman to ever love me or to have sex with me or whatever." Um, that's just, you know, it seems such a ludicrous thing <laughs> in my yeah. head, but you know. <laughs> There's definitely something up in the air right now um, with this whole fatalistic mindset, I guess you could call it. And, you know, then you have a guy, you you, you didn't mention him before, but you mentioned people like him, uh, Elliot Rogers in 2014, I guess, who was an incel, and he actually wrote a manifesto in which he mentioned that he was an incel. Mm. And then he went out and shot a lot of people and then killed himself. Mm. And people, incels in particular, these fatalistic, defeated people, they look to him as a hero. Mm. And they usually, if you talk to them, if you find them out in the wild, you know, on Reddit or Twitter, whatever, they won't categorically deny that they cannot do a shooting as well. Um, so well, I guess what I'm teasing out or trying to tease out is that there's there's definitely some call, some kind of depressive realism, but there's also, you know, Frankenstein's monster version of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, what it leads to, I guess. Uh, yeah, and and I mean, it's frightening, really. And But what I think from a purely analytical perspective, it, what is also interesting is the ways in which the depressed, depressed people that we've been discussing up until this point, and now some of these right-wingers, incels, uh, young men who, uh, who who feel like their whole future and all their rights have been, you know, taken away from them. The ways in which these two kinds of depressions are kind of, you know, yeah. that they are both, yeah, modes of depression, that they are symptoms of the same society. Um, and different reactions to it. And I think we can easily criticize some of, I mean, edit, almost every one of these um, incels. And of course, it's, I mean, they're killing people and they're writing racist, misogynist things um, 
online. And of course, it is important to not only criticize them, but to actively, you know, um, go against them. But it's also important, uh, again, from an analytical point of view, to try to understand, um, however horrifying, to try to understand um, where they're coming from and what yeah. they are speaking about and what their position in society is. Um, Absolutely. I actually, you're actually segueing very well into what I want to do next, um, and that is read you a quote from your book, mm. and then sort of um, you know have you comment on it. I guess uh, ex exactly in in terms of empathetic understanding and well maybe just <laughs> from the st from the start uh, the the analytical understanding. I'll just read it from page one hundred five for anyone following along at home. Uh, you're actually talking about, uh, you're sort of reading David Foster Wallace's B.I. number 20 with mm. the Good Samaritan. Mm. And now you're sort of concluding, like, what, what will this lead to? And, um, you know, it's it's about, I guess the story, if I'm not uh, if I'm not wrong, is about a woman who gets kidnapped, kidnapped by a rapist. Mm. Is that correct? Yeah, and potential serial killer, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. <clears throat> but what you draw out... Yeah, it's an um, awful story, really, and it's difficult to explain in a few words, that's for sure. Okay, but I'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll just recommend people to read it then. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll just read, up, uh, read um, out loud now um, about this woman and the rapist. She does not say, you are my neighbor, but rather, I am your neighbor. The difference is radical, since she does not make him into an object of her hippie-like, New Age-ish love, but presupposes the capacity for love in him, thereby making her into the object of his potential love. More, more accurately, she makes herself into the thou that is so unfamiliar and frightening to the rapist. And I guess, you know, when it comes to depression, I believe you write it in the book somewhere as well, that the loss of the future is also the loss of the other. Um, mm. you know, I, I know this this is a lot to take in, but could you sort of um, bring us up to speed? Like, what do you mean? Like, what can you tell from this situation here? What can you make out of it? Well, I think I mean what I want to say actually uh, to be truthful. Uh, um, is that <clears throat> some of the things that I write in the book? Uh, they are pretty troublesome to me now, and but uh, but maybe more accurately, uh, I have, especially David Foster Wallace and Michelle Lubeck, um, <laughs> that I have devoted so so much attention, really, mm -hmm. um, and analytical attention. What I've also, in hindsight, been trying to do, I think, is trying to work my way and write my way through their work. So it started out as a fascination. I really liked their work. But now, on the other side of this book, I really don't. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and I've thought about that a lot. Um, why is that the case? But maybe it's not that unusual that the stuff that you are really working through is also the stuff that really makes you tired and, you know, you want to throw up, basically. But, yeah. but, but you also write to arrive at a point where you can write something else and something different. And I think, I mean, that is certainly true of these passages on David Foster Wallace, but also on Will Beck, to be honest, um, especially do these two chapters. So that's not a, a way of, you know, <laughs> being um, too hard on myself, I guess. But it's just, a, you know, it, it's been an interesting experience let's put it that let's put it that way but i mean this particular specific passage it's really difficult to unpack um yeah uh so i am not quite sure where to begin yeah um well, I and I, I think oh, no just go on just oh. save me here <laughs> okay i will um you know um this is actually something we can go back to no i'll i'll go back to mark fisher now because you know one of the things that he's talking about is this how to um and I think this is what I was trying to get at without saying it. So maybe I'm in the wrong and not you. Uh, he, 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 you know, he has this project of sort of infusing 
modern movements we see today with an anti anti capitalist edge, you know, mm. um, and also a, a, a kind of socialization. I believe he calls it. Mm. And I was sort of seeing this this uh, passageway, this way of viewing the other, as sort of a way to get us there. Because, uh, you know, when I look at these uh, amazing movements going on right now, Gilles Jeune in France, um, whatever Greta Thunberg has got cooking up, uh, you know, she's mm. really made quite a splash. And you can, you know, things in Chile and in Hong Kong, you know, all these things, uh, they stay at that horizontal, very impersonal level. They, you know, you can maybe critique me here, but they don't really amount to much more than that. And I was just trying to sort of fuse this quote with that conundrum in a way or trying mm. to get us there uh, i was wondering was that something you could elaborate on or yeah i mean what what i can say is that at the time i was really into and perhaps too much into uh the question of spirituality or the spirit as a political concept in a way uh, i read it out of banner stigler and he talks about spirit in a really interesting way so what I was convinced, and I think I still am, but perhaps less so, um, is that we cannot solely talk about material or materialist issues, also in, ter in terms of talking about anti-capitalism and social movements. There has to be some kind of spiritual, or one might also say affective. Mm. Uh, Vitalist, maybe even. Aspect. Yeah, may I'm I'm not sure about vitalism, but some kind of emotions or affects that are also animating your actions in a way, and something to believe in as uh, you know a precondition for getting out of bed and for actually you know doing stuff. Because if you do not believe in anything, then you might as well just not do anything, right? No. And I think what I've been trying to do in my chapter on Rulbeck, where I talk about spirit uh, in a way and and religion also, um, yeah. and in these passages on Wallace uh, with St. Kierkegaard and the question of love and the Christian um, imperative of loving thy neighbor, it's also a, a way of talking about cures to depression. And in Wallace, that often gets called empathy. Hmm. And I have been since then skeptical of the notion of empathy, preferring instead <laughs> to talk about care as yeah. a concept. I think that's much more helpful. And I think okay, yeah. one might also translate this passage into a question of care, caring for the other or caring for the others. And what I do believe that this passage tries to say is that you shouldn't care about other people only if and when they are nice people. Hmm. You sh we shouldn't take care of refugees because they are nice people from the Middle East. Hmm. That has absolutely nothing to do with the question of migration or the question of refugees and the question of political action in that hmm. case. And we shouldn't care about the neighbor because he or she or they are nice. Hmm. So the task that I think Wallace puts in front of us, and Kierkegaard certainly does as well, is that <clears throat> the task is much more radical. And it is a question of loving or caring for people even when they are strange and strangers and when they are not like you and when they are hideous, as these men in the stories of Davis Wallace, they always are. And of course, the title gives that away. I mean, <laughs> the title of the book in which the story appears is called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. Yeah. So there is the question of misogyny and masculinity at stake here as well. But where I am a bit uncomfortable, and I think some readers may be as well, is that to what extent should we, you know, how far does our ability to care or to presuppose love in the other, how far does that ability go or how far should that go should we yeah. care for people who are racist i'm not sure and i think that's difficult questions uh, but i also do think and that point remains valid i do think that these were the questions that wallace himself was also himself sorry was also struggling with and i think that made a lot of his readers uncomfortable as well and what i do still also think holds true is the importance of trying to 
confront difficult questions, uncomfortable questions head on instead of, you know, dodging them or avoiding them altogether. I think this is a way of not answering your question, but maybe still answering it in some way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess I am not really an analyst yet. <laughs> I guess I'm I'm trying to get there someday, and uh, that that allows me to be very overtly political in my in my questions. Um, you know, um, I just uh, yeah, I, I think that's just well, <laughs> that's why I want those those um, tricky tricky questions and those tricky answers because there's no easy answer to any of this no um one thing i just wanted to 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 ask you about is um the current climate we are in today uh, mm. i'll just move on very very quickly and very elegantly uh into the impact of the coronavirus um mm. we have seen during this uh, trying times a lot of death a lot of people uh, getting fired uh, a lot of unfortunate no unfortunate disgusting ways of talking about other people but we have also seen these amazing displays of community um mm. you know in denmark we have these uh, uh you know people going and i guess this is not only a danish phenomenon i guess it's it's all over all around the world where people would gather on their balconies and then sing to each other and then they mm. would organize it through facebook and there's also these Facebook groups where they gather people around who help out the, uh, the, the persons who are infected with the coronavirus. Mm. And it just seems to me that people are going out of their way to, you know, almost be with other people. And, uh, you know, there's also the whole thing about social distancing. So mm. with all of these, <laughs> with all of these, uh, these things, um, how do you view, you know, in, co in, in conjunction with depression, how do you view the current coronavirus, I guess, I would say, I'd ask you. Yeah, I think we have different topics here. Uh, I think the first one is that, of course, the relation between depression is and the coronavirus is not an immediate or an obvious one. Mm -hmm. um, but what I do think is clear, and I think there's also been some data um, evidencing this, um, is that the current crisis if we can even go so and and i do believe that it is a crisis it is an ecological and an economic crisis and it is a social crisis and it is a also a healthcare crisis but it is also a crisis of mental health and i think that's perhaps been and, and of course for obvious reasons and i mean those reasons being that people are dying and people are losing other people and uh unemployment there are a lot of you know more immediate concerns maybe but i think the issue of mental health in this situation is also pertinent and remains uh, to be analyzed in a way um and i think i mean when i've talked to my students i think it's clear that some of them are feeling much more isolated much more depressed much more anxious um while others, of course, on the other hand, may thrive and, and in this um, in some regnum. Um, and I think we do, we have seen a rise in suicide, um, suicides um, during this crisis. So we have a lot of stuff here in terms of not only physical health, but also mental health. Definitely. And then with the community singing, no, and then what I also wanted to say is that Going back to the one of the first points that we were talking about, namely the question of how are you? Or yeah. How's it going? I think I've actually asked this question for the first time in my life. I've asked this question to friends and other people and meant it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's been quite remarkable that I have both with friends, but also, I mean, strangers, uh, you know, academic people that you are just for somehow writing an email that's actually been a sincere uh, exchange and sincere exchange of concerns and you know care maybe also um, so i think that's been remarkable i think with the community singing on balconies and also in denmark i think that's obviously not enough. And I think sometimes it also get this nationalist flavor in a way. It certainly does in Denmark, where we have this Danish way of thinking, 
singing together. Um, and then it is also a question of who is left out of that singing, who's part of the singing and who is not. So I think it's not as simple as, okay, yes, we have a lot of new communities springing up in this time of crisis. We have also, and of course, we do have people going out of the way, as you put it, to help other people or to be with other people or to be near other people yeah. to meet us away. But we also have some exclusion going on. We have some nationalisms going on. Um, can, can, that I also, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, just uh, uh, interrupt me, please. <laughs> I, I will, because this is something I haven't considered myself. So I'm, I'm really, really curious about the exclusion going on in these communities. Could you expand on that? Yes, I mean, we have the Danish National Broadcasting Company or system that has this uh, singing along or sing along events every day, but especially Friday night, right? And people can, you know, record their singing on the phone. And, you know, my children have to have done that. And, and I've got, I'm not necessarily against this kind of, you know, community. But it's also so clear to me that it's a very white, a white um, phenomenon. And it's a very... nationalist way of going about things um, that has left me wondering about uh, who is inside of this singing and who is not hmm. if that makes sense I hope it does yeah yeah I, I, I guess it does um, I was you know I when I, the Danish broadcasting that's dear right that's what yeah. they called it yeah um, you know I always viewed the as actually a, a place where we could get some sense of community i, I guess nationalized yeah I, yeah uh, but i guess nationalization isn't always the <laughs> the thing we have to be careful of uh so, so i was i was kind of yeah i guess i'm i'm prodding you on this one because mm. um what what's the what's what's so bad i guess you could say what's so bad about this kind of community you know a, a wide thing i guess dear isn't isn't it for everyone it's public and uh, you have to have it. You have to pay a license to have. It, you know, I, I guess I'm I'm trying you on this one because I uh, I uh, yeah I see it as a kind of more emancipatory than you do. Yeah. Um, but well, I mean, in principle, it is of course for everyone uh, living in Denmark um, with a uh, is that called IP address also uh, in English. Uh, so yeah. I guess it is for everyone, but that's only in principle and on paper. Um, I think in reality it is not and you know I'm living in a neighborhood uh, where my kids go to school where I think we are maybe 25% white people and I've talked to other parents uh, Muslim parents for instance uh, and they certainly do not sing along uh, <laughs> they are not part of this community singing and of course then one might very well say well that's their own fault they i mean the offers there yeah, the danish liberal, broadcasting company answer, yeah. yeah so but i think i mean that's one aspect that i think it's important to to think about but i also do think that i mean then we have people in in camps around the country we have uh, asylum seekers and when speaking about social distancing when speaking about staying at home it's of course ridiculous because they people these people they do not have a home exactly. and uh, they do not ha have the opportunity to uh, to be social distancing and they certainly do not have the opportunity to sing along with a bunch of other uh, <laughs> Danish people um so i think these are important questions and but uh, then on the other hand we have care in this situation that extends beyond the family, beyond the hospital, beyond the state. And I think those are the movements and the moments that I'm really interested hmm. in. Yeah. Yeah. That makes while, sense. At, while, while at the same time going through an, an extended crisis of care um, that is always already on the brink of collapse, if it has not in fact collapsed already. So it is, it is of course, this... Um, paradoxical situation okay well moving on from that I, I i will just read you a quote from this book you've already mentioned it we've already been talking about it but i feel like this quote perfectly um let me just see if i can find it yeah it perfectly sort of encapsulates the issue one might face when when reading this book and i'll just read this quote to you uh and this is yeah this is out this is as well from from the wallace 
uh, chapter, so you may disagree with it. But depression saturates being. It is a feeling which takes complete possession of the human being that experiences it. In that sense, the allusion to the physical concept of black holes is not out of place. Since there's no bottom to a black hole, it simply engulfs you, rips you further and further apart in the dead mass of darkness where the pull of gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape. It reflects no light. When things sound that um, uh, menacing and so, I guess I would say totalizing as well, how on mm. earth do we cure ourselves of depression? <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe going back, and since we are both uh, 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 from Denmark, um, we can go back to San Kierkegaard to begin with and, and say that when he talks about hope, and I will get back to why this is relevant, when, when he talks about hope, he says that the real task of hope does not arise in a situation, in a situation filled with light. It does not arise in a situation in a situation where everything is just fine and dandy. The real task and the real paradoxical radical task of hope only, um, yeah, arises in a situation that seems objectively hopeless. That is where we really need to be able to hope. And I think, I mean, I think there are two steps in this book. The first one is to present an at an analysis of depression and by proxy of contemporary society and the political economy that is accurate and thus also dark. Um, there is no question to my mind that things are really not going that great, that we are in a state of deep economic, ecological and psychological crisis. Um, but that doesn't mean that there is no cure and that there is no solution to the problem. So I think that's an important first step, but then we need to take a step more. And some people, they don't take that first step. They just go to the second one saying, well, everything is fine. We should just stay positive. Things are great. But there are also some people who stay in that first one saying, well, there's no light. It's only shit and dark and <laughs> whatever else you can imagine. Um, so I think, okay, we have a situation in which the economic, ecological crisis are only getting worse by the day, even if the emissions uh, currently are, you know, falling because of, you know, the lack of air traffic and the lack of uh, uh, the use of oil, etc. Um, okay, I kind of lost the thread. There. No, and we have a situation in which, in which more and more people are becoming are diagnosed with depression. Um, and I think, so how do we proceed from here? Um, I think the cure is care, uh, to put it into a slogan. Uh, that cure is health care. Also going back to your point about national health care, of course. Of course, it's a good thing to have a welfare system like the Danish one compared to the one in the US. Yeah. There's no question about it. Definitely, it, yeah. it offers people the, up, the opportunity to actually get treated for their various illnesses mm. having said that it's clear to me that it's also not enough and that the care you are offered within the welfare system is not enough mm. so i think we need care that extends beyond the hospital and the state and the family but also extends beyond the dominant forms of therapy cognitive ther therapy and positive psychology i don't know if you've ever been to a therapist i have and i think it's clear to me that that discourse and that help is an individualized and to some extent, medicalized one, um, and where the purpose is to get back to get people back to being productive, positive citizens, and to get people to get back to work, uh, a work that may very well have been a cause of their depression in the first place. But I think the cure is also economic and political. Sometimes having a job is the cure. I think sometimes having another job is the cure, and sometimes not being indebted is the cure. And I think there's a lot to be learned from various projects in the 19th centuries, in, no, not centuries, century, <laughs> um, where a lot of medical solutions to the medical problems of, you know, to medical illnesses and medical diseases were not found within the realm of medicine, were not found within the bio 
logical uh, or the medical realm, but were found within urban planning. They were found the solution within better air, better water, um, more light within the apartments. All those things that we know by now, they actually, you know, sometimes they actually um, had the benefit of, you know, destroying the conditions for the diseases in question. I think we need to also go to the bottom of the problem of depression and, you know, not only treat the symptoms, but also uh, treat the causes. And of course, within the diagnostic manuals, these causes are not addressed. They only speak about symptoms um, that you may not be able to sleep or that you are um, that you're just not feeling well. Um, but I think there are reasons, historical, political, economic reasons why so many people are not feeling well. Um, so I think, and of course this is a bit abstract, but I think it's important to insist on these um, questions, um, but also insist on on the necessity of getting out of bed. Um, I think, I mean, that is the most Im one of the most important tasks today. I mean, before we can do revolutions, before we can do social radical social changes, we need to be able to get out of bed. Really, I've written that yeah. before also. But I, but I think I mean that is that's uh, stayed with me that notion. And of course, I mean to be able to get out of bed, we also we also need radical solutions. We also need networks of care, uh, so that the, we have this uh, dialectical relationship one might say between uh, radical change or social change and you know uh, psychological change and of of course the point here is not to you know psychologize politics or to reduce the question of you know the political economy to a question of psychology and of course the goal is not to get another diagnosis included in the dsm so that we can talk about corona concerns or corona anxiety or climate grief mm. but it is important for me to recognize uh, and take seriously um, the depth of these kinds of suffering um, of the pain of depression and to start thinking about getting people out of bed in the morning <laughs>